Bonjour. Je m'appelle Bianca, and that is the extent of my French for today's presentation. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be invited here in France to speak in an event such as this. Um, something that I've been really proud to, to be a part of, particularly in my, my career, my 19-year career across um, IT, working with Agile and Lean methodologies. It's a privilege to be here today to tell you a bit more about Intuit's story and how we approach customer obsession in everything that we do. We'll have time for questions um, during the presentation, so if you've got any questions, um, please make sure that you hold them because I'd love to make this interactive and hopefully take something away, have you all take something away from today's presentation that you can take back to your organisations and your teams at the end of the conference. So let's get started. So what will we cover today? Today we're going to focus on three core areas for our presentation. Um, I will cover how Intuit is a 36-year-old startup. Uh, we're a Fortune 500 company headquartered in Silicon Valley in Mountain View, California. And how what we'll be focusing on is how we continue to reinvent and disrupt ourselves while maintaining a true customer-obsessed culture across the entire organisation, not just in product management teams, not just in product development teams, but regardless of the role that you're in, whether you're internal or external facing, we will talk about how we scale customer obsession across the organisation. We'll also talk a little bit, I'll talk about how we continue to humanise the experience that we deliver um, to our customers. I'll also show you some examples about how we applied Lean in our business um, across every aspect of our business and the role that this plays in innovation. So I'll talk to you about our Design for Delight principles, which is a methodology, um, a customer-driven innovation methodology that we use extensively across Intuit and something that we're um, renowned for across the world. And then finally, how do you implement and ultimately scale uh, your customer, you know, your customer organisation-wide customer innovation-driven program? So I'll start a little bit. Now, I'll start now on customer obsession. So this man here is Scott Cook, um, Intuit's founder, and Scott um, Scott created Intuit 36 years ago, basically focusing on solving a problem that him and his wife were having in terms of running their business and balancing their family checkbook. What Scott has gone on to do in the organisation, he's still very much a part of the organisation today. He coaches extensively. Um, he's still our, one of our founding, um, our executive chairman of the board. And what Scott has taught the organisation is that in the absence of a product, in the absence of a business, everything has to revolve around the customer. So it's not just about, and particularly I recognise in this audience, there's a number of IT professionals, and I'm sure that as in with IT professionals, it depends on your role, whether you're working internally in IT departments, you know, I've worked internally with IT teams myself, whether you're product developers working on an external facing customer application, what role does the customer actually play? And that can mean different things for different organisations. What I've learned, particularly my time, my five years at Intuit, is that regardless of what we do, if it doesn't deliver value or doesn't add benefit for the customer, it becomes irrelevant. So what I'll talk to you a little bit about is how we approach customer obsession um, and specifically how we've taken, you know, what steps we've taken to incorporate that in everything that we do in the organisation. So for those of you, though, that may not a little bit about Intuit's story, you're probably thinking, who is Intuit? What do they do? I haven't heard of them. Um, Intro, as I said earlier, Intuit is, is a Fortune 500 company based in Silicon Valley in California. We're th we refer to ourselves as the 36-year-old startup. And the reason why we continue to refer to ourselves as a startup is that because we continue to reinvent ourselves. This article is really poignant because it's an, it's an article from a couple of years ago that our, our CEO, Brad Smith, at the time um, found and came across on a flight where he was obviously quite shocked to see, see the headline, why isn't Intuit dead? Because if you look around in the valley and you look at a number of large organisations of our size, many of those organisations don't exist. You know, we all have worked with, you know, the, we've all heard the stories of the Kodaks, the Blockbusters, and how businesses have failed to innovate and change and adapt and evolve as the industry shifts around them. Thankfully, Intuit, what we do is we continue to reinvent ourselves and continue to innovate. And how we do that is what keeps us relevant for our customers. The way that we really approach it is that, you know, we look at it this way as saying is, is we're the Tom Brady of our industry, performing at the top of its game at an age when its one-time peers have long, stopped, have long since stopped playing. 
How we do that is we continue to look at, hold a mirror up to our organisation and look within and continue to challenge ourselves to raise the bar and not get complacent on what we deliver for our customers. For me, it's not just what I, what I noticed when I joined the organisation was it's not just about the CEO saying and looking at our values on the wall and saying, yes, we, we're obsessed about our customers. We genuinely care about what our customers think. You know, in my role, I spend so much time going and spending time talking to our customers. I lead the customer success team, so my team obviously interact with our customers on a daily basis. But in my role, I can choose not to connect with customers, but I do. You know, I've connected with our customers on Facebook. They will, you know, whenever we have a conference, it, there's lots of hugs and it, it's, it's like catching up with old friends because of the types of relationships that we build with our customers, we choose to build with our customers. We recognise that without our customers, we don't have a product. We wouldn't be a relevant business. And that's how we've continued to, to reinvent our, say, ourselves and stay relevant throughout each of the different journeys in the Internet of Things, where you think about the era of DOS, the era of Windows, the era of Web, um, the era of mobile and cloud, and particularly now as we enter into the era of AI and innovation in terms of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, we want to make sure that we continue to stay relevant and remain up to date with what's happening in the industry around us and that we're continuing to add value for our customers. The key piece that I really want you to think about in customer obsession and how what, that, what you're doing in your organisations, because some of you may already be doing this, and if you are, fantastic, that's, congratulations, that's amazing. Unfortunately, though, what I find is a lot of companies aren't still doing this. And they're the ones that I find will still will remain irrelevant in time or become irrelevant in time because you have to be willing to dramatically, to fo basically to dramatically focus on the customer at all costs, even at the cost of obsoleting your own stuff. Now, this is really poignant because we've all got an opinion, we've all got ideas, and we've all got hopefully fantastic ideas. However, what I've learned in my time is that Whatever ideas I have, unless it's relevant for the customer, I need to let that go. I need to make sure that I'm focusing what's right for my customers because in the absence of doing that, I could be building something without connecting with my customers that becomes irrelevant and it becomes waste. And in the, obviously in the, um, in the era of lean, which you all understand, we're here trying to, re to re remove and avoid waste work. So by putting the customer at front and centre of everything that you do can really help you hopefully to avoid, um, avoid that. So how do we look at implementing innovation at scale at Intuit? And it's through this program called Design for Delight. And I'll share with you a couple of tools and templates throughout this session that you can connect with afterwards um, to hopefully take something back practical if you haven't heard about our Design for Delight methodology. So Design for Delight is a, is a program, an innovation program that we teach um, at Intuit. And every single one of our 9,000 employees is taught Design for Delight, our Design for Delight principles, or D for D, as we refer to it. We've had our CEO come out to Australia and spend time teaching us D for D. Our co-founder, Scott Cook, comes out and teaches us D for D. I'm an innovation catalyst, so I teach the Australian business D for D. My team, everybody, the whole business is taught on the consistent language that we use across the organisation. This is grounded in customer obsession because without customer obsession, this doesn't work. This photo was actually taken um, of myself facilitating a session the Friday before I left for my, um, for my vacation because it's something that we fundamentally believe in that we need to invest in our employees to help them understand our, our approach to innovation and how it applies lean principles. If I, sp if I spread it into the two components, um, and just a quick show of hands, has anybody actually heard of Design for Delight or Customer Driven Innovation before? Anyone? A couple of little hands? Fantastic. Great. Um, so hopefully I'll get a few head nods as we, as we go along the way. If you think of it in two different components, so you've got Customer Driven Innovation is how we choose which problems we want to focus on solving for our customers. Design for Delight is how we solve those problems. So it's the approach that we take to solving those problems. So what I'll draw to you um, on the, on the left-hand side is that if you think about, we might we identify through our customer research, our customer um, time with customers, it could be feedback through customer care or customer support, it could be feedback through sales, it could be feedback through our product channels. We have numerous sources of what we call voice of customer throughout our product, um, our product strategy. What we do is we identify an important unsolved customer problem. 
We then have, there has to be something that we and those that we enable can solve well. So that could be our app partner platform, for instance, as part of our ecosystem. And finally, that allows us to build durable competitive advantage. That's what we talk about with focusing on customer driven innovation. It needs to still be core to you know, QuickBooks. Intuit um, obviously is the, the maker of QuickBooks, um, a global product used by more than 4 million people around the globe. And the product and the solutions that we choose to build have to serve the purpose that QuickBooks is obviously here to, here to solve for our customers. If it doesn't, it's not about us going off into a completely different industry and into a completely different vertical. It has to intersect. And that's why those three key areas are really important. What we then do is we then look at how do we solve those problems is by looking at deep customer empathy. And we do that through programs called Follow Me Homes. So Follow Me Homes is a method that we use um, for people who might work with user experience designers, we actually go out and spend time in our customers' premises. So the term follow me home sounds like I'm stalking someone and generally I don't. They know that I'm coming to their premises. But I actually go into their office and observe them in their natural, I will refer to as their natural habitat. So I will go into their office and as a, as a former product manager, this is what I would do when I was helping to achieve product market fit for QuickBooks in Australia. What I would do is I would go and spend time with our customers and look at the workflows with them, watch them as they interacted with the product versus me telling them or showing them what I wanted them to do. And I think that's what I found is something that it's a critical skill that so many people typically skip over in this part of the process because having deep customer empathy is the most critical part of helping you on your journey to having a lean, a lean approach to making sure that you're building the right things for the right reasons. We then look at going broad to going narrow. And what that means is really, really broadening out all the different solutions. So brainstorming the different approaches that we could be taking to solving those deep customer problems that we may have identified. Um, looking at different ways that we can solve those problems and just thinking really, really broad and then narrowing down onto something that's so uncomfortable that you feel like you're not focusing on enough. And that's something that I've found has been a real challenge for myself personally because we ultimately all want to fix everything, whether you're a developer, whether you're a business analyst, product manager, project manager, what have you, you want to do it all. The reality is, though, is that you need to focus on narrowing and do that one thing and do it really, really well. To help us identify whether or not we've picked the right problem, our founder, Scott Cooks, refers to it as finding that needle in the eye pain. So it's picking that type of pain and looking to solve that type of pain that is so painful. It's like someone's popping a needle into your eye because we all know if you get that grain of sand or something in your eye, how irritating that is. That's the kind of pain that we're looking to try to solve for. But so once we know that we've identified that, that's when we know that we're focusing on the right things for our customers. And then finally, we'll work, focus on building lightweight, rapid experiments um, with our customers. Now, that could be prototyping, that could be um, A-B tests, that could be, um, you know, dry tests that we ultimately might mock up to create sort of fake experiences just to test what the customer interaction will be. But again, we take a very experimentation approach before we actually commit anything to code. And again, something that I've seen some businesses do really well, um, others that I've seen that haven't adopted this model because it's such a big, big organisation. What I typically do, though, is with my team in customer success, so I don't have developers in my team, but we obviously we can still work with our development teams. What we typically try to do is I, I find to help me and my team be more effective in the business, we will use experimentation as much as we can, even just to get the proof of concept off the ground to prove out a business case. And I think that's where, having worked in large organisations, I recognise it can be really, really hard to go to a senior leader and say, hey, I need budget, I need resource for this particular problem that we need to solve. And part of that issue is they're saying, well, why should I invest half a million dollars in that project? Why should I invest a million, two million? How are you going to guarantee the ROI on that project? And it's really difficult. It's difficult for all of us in, the, in, the, you know, in our professions. By taking an experimentation approach, what it allows you to do, and you think about your build measure, you know, your build measure learn loops that ultimately we all use in Lean and through Agile principles, is that what it allows you to do is gain the data and the insights from those lightweight experiments that you're ultimately running to prove or disprove that hypothesis. And that ultimately is what you then lean into your business case and what obviously informs your business case to hopefully then get the investment that you need. My team have had some um, 
we've developed some different um, learning AI machine learning um, bots to help actually onboard team members that have now been picked up. We launched in Australia that have now been picked up and are being used globally by our teams, um, by our teams in the US. We've run experiments on social media. We've done all sorts of different experiments. And even from a team in Australia, we're actually helping to influence the US strategy, which for me is something that's really, really cool because we didn't expect to be able to do that. But it just shows the power of innovating. You can actually start with a zero budget. And I'm talking, I have no budget. I have no high-end budgets to invest in people and time. It's only time is what we spend. And that can be really, really powerful when you invest in the right places. So this is the money slide. So if you're going to take a photo of any slide, this would be the one that I'd recommend because this is the one that I want you to Google afterwards. This slide is the... This really helps to sort of bring together our design for delight principles. And it's one that I teach. Um, and, I, and I've talked to a lot of those elements already, um, you know, just in, in the lead-up to this. Because what it really helps you understand is that when we talk about that customer-driven innovation, where we talk about developing deep customer empathy, and where you observe customers, you savour the surprises, and you really get into understanding why a customer's having that problem and how can you solve that problem. You then take those insights to then go abroad to generate as many possible ideas as you can and then get uncomfortably narrow. As I said, just think about that needle in the eye pain that I shared with you earlier. Which then informs us to actually be able to make, have rapid experiments, to create rapid experiments, to test out those different solutions and ideas before you commit to whichever solution it is that you want to pursue. Having that experiment is really, really, is really critical because it allows you to define your leap of, faith, leap of faith assumption. So testing what you don't know. There's always elements that we don't know when we're building out um, proof of concepts. Whether you're working in, in previous, um, previous roles, I've had development teams work on a spike to actually go and try to test their way into saying, well, we'll estimate how big a solution is going to be. We don't have those same sorts of challenges now because we create lightweight experiments to help us test those leap of faith assumptions and help us to be fast and frugal um, to really look at what's the right approach to take and ultimately learn and decide our way forward. And what that then influences is that then helps us identify what is our, our ideal state. So what does truly awesome look like for our customer and how do we, de how do we deliver customer benefit? As I said before, if you're not developing, if you're not delivering customer value, I'd question what are you here for? Because that's what we're all in the game to do. We're all here to develop, to deliver value and deliver benefit for our customers. That's ultimately what helps to generate business performance results, you know, increase your business um, revenue, what have you. So really think about what are you focusing on and how does it deliver true customer benefit? Because that benefit is really the improvement in the customer's life is what matters most um, when customers are choosing their products. Because these days we've got startups happening all around us, all around the world, and there's always smaller, more nimble people around you nipping at our heels who can do things better, faster, particularly those of us who are working in large organisations. And then ultimately what that leads to is that leads to increased delight of using your product, um, increased word of mouth, obviously hopefully increasing your customer base and ultimately leads to improved revenue for the business as well. Now, this applies whether you're in an external customer-facing role, so whether you're building products externally or whether you're building products internally. Our finance teams use this process. Our HR teams use this process. Our talent acquisition. The entire business, regardless of the role that you're in, uses design for delight. So I think it's something that's really powerful because it's quite simple, but it's really powerful when understood widely across the organisation can actually have a, a profound impact, particularly on being lean. So I'll talk to you now about some of the key components of Design for Delight. And, and as I've sort of said earlier, um, specifically Follow Me Homes. And I like to talk about Follow Me Homes because it's something that, as I said, it often it is it's such a critical part, I think, of our journey when we're building out software or building out solutions for our customers that often people don't spend enough time with customers at the right stage in the process. I can talk to people and they said, yeah, I spoke to the customer. I go, when? Oh, when we, when we put it to beta. Or when we built the alpha. Or when we built the, you know, when we're ready to ship. It's too late. You need to speak to the customer up front. Collect those insights. You could have the most intelligent minds in the world working on your initiative but unless you spend time with your customers early in the cycle, early in the design process, 
you could actually make that you could take them go and you could actually go down the completely wrong path. So spending time with your customers is such a critical component um, in our innovation, our innovation practices. And as I said, we refer to it as follow me homes. Um, I'd encourage you to Google follow me homes. And for those of you that haven't spent time with a customer, that's okay. Now's a really good time to start. Because it's really simple just to get out of the office and you actually have to get out of the office and actually go and spend time in your customers' um, premises. And you'd be quite surprised just how much your customers actually appreciate that. You know, I've been to, I've, my, one of my recent ones was I went to, um, it was a horse riding school, so I went to stables. And I was literally in, I had one of the photos and I took it out of the deck, but I was literally in the horse stables with the business owner and next to her were her horses. You know, so you get to work in some really cool little areas where you get to meet your customers and see how they're interacting with your product and hear from them firsthand. Um, I've been to, to gyms, I've been to obviously work with accountants and bookkeepers, num numerous accounting and bookkeeping firms. But it's really interesting when you get to know how your end users are interacting with your product. Because one, they think, they're like, wow, these guys really care about me. Like it's, it's so rare to have my software vendor want to actually hear what I think about using their product. So there's an instant delight factor, but two, you're hearing them. You know, and there's nothing more powerful than being heard about how your customers are interacting with your product because it's really powerful to then take back to your teams and that ultimately motivates and inspires the rest of the team to continue to keep going. We were talking about it at dinner last night where there's a number of engineers who ultimately get further removed from the customer and they, they get so caught up in the internal bureaucracies that are within product development teams in terms of your sprint cycles and sprint planning, what have you, that the time that they actually spend actually developing for customers starts to be reduced. By putting developers front and centre in front of customers, watch how much that engages them. Watch what happens to their employee engagement scores when they're actually realising the impact of what they do day to day and how that's helping someone. That's a game changer. So how do you scale it? And it's really simple. When you think about how do you scale um, your customer-driven innovation program, it's running programs like this. As I said, this is just a, a small sub subset of, um, of the team that we trained. And, and what we do is we run a three-day Design for Delight program um, in the Australian office two to three times a year, depending on when we have people. Um, we run it in our internal training rooms. There's a number of um, innovation catalysts like myself, or what you think of us as innovation coaches, who coach and teach D for D around the organisation. We're part of a, a global innovation catalyst community. But what's really important is that in order to, and one of my leadership principles is to lead by example. So if you think about innovation and teaching innovation, it's how are you showing up as a leader, if you're a leader, or whether you're, um, you know, you're working as a mentor, how are you showing up to actually show people the way? Because some of this stuff's really hard. And if you haven't done it before, it can be really difficult to take that first step in how you actually approach innovation. And it needs a lot of courage and it needs to be bold. But in doing that, by actually forming a community in the office or your team and actually teaching people of their journey and teaching people of your innovation practices, it just starts with starting with some basic training and education, starting with one team and there could be another team and it builds and eventually you can create your own internal community to help you look at how do you scale your customer innovation, um, customer driven innovation program. As a teaching a team and leading by example for me is key. You know, so in customer success, my team know that because I can teach innovation, I'll teach it internally, I'll teach it externally, that I'm also able to sit there shoulder to shoulder with them, run and facilitate workshops to help them work through what are the different elements that they're trying to narrow down on to ultimately solve for our customer problems. You know, I ran a session with our sales and marketing team a couple of weeks back where they were working on trying to improve um, their processes when it came to, to looking at lead you know, lead optimization between marketing and sales from marketing campaigns. And again, being able to facilitate these different workshops, we didn't have to spend four days, five days in an ideation session, which is what I would have done in previous organisations. Instead, we spent an hour to actually rapidly brainstorm what it was, what the problems were that we wanted to solve, how we were going to solve them and ultimately narrow it down and what type of experiments we we're going to run to ultimately solve that, the lead optimization program. As I said, completely transferable regardless of which, what subject matter you're working on. As I mentioned, building a team of experts to help coach others, I've found has been one of our tools, um, our tools to success and ensure it. 
because as I said, we're part of an into, um, we have an innovation catalyst community around the globe. There's about, I want to say there's probably about 20 to 30 of us. And what we do is we effectively, um, we sign up to become innovation catalysts um, every year. And what we commit to is we'll commit to spending 10% of our time to coach other teams on our D4D methodology. So we've made that commitment to continue to invest in ourselves, to invest in others, to help with innovation and help teach innovation. And that's one way to be able to continue to keep our innovation journey and our innovation culture alive and, and present within our, D, uh, within our DNA. It's really easy for people to go to a training course, become certified in D4D, and then not do anything with it. Go back to their desks and keep doing the same thing as they did the day before. But what's important is by having a team of people in your organisation who can support others. And like I said, I'm not in sales and I'm not in marketing, but I still, they asked me, they said, Bianca, can you help us facilitate this particular workshop? I was like, absolutely. This is one way of me getting better at my skills because I need to, to in order to get better at it, I need to teach it and coach it. Um, and this ultimately challenges me, but I'm helping out another team as well. So again, really encourage you to think about how do you help to um, build a team of experts in your organisation who can then go on to teach others. I would then recommend also too that you centralise your resources. So in the time that I've been, I've been travelling for the last two weeks, we've actually just launched our new internal um, intranet, which is our new sort of, um, our new sort of work day or, well, actually, no, it's Workday Insight, whichever it's on. But it's basically a new website for us where we can actually, you can see the download DFD method cards. So what we're doing is we're actually creating and publishing the resources for everybody. It's not just available for managers, it's available for frontline team members. So I've got team members who answer, who answer the phones, chat, etc. Everyone will have access to all of these resources. So as you standardise whatever your innovation practices are, don't just keep them in the IT team. Don't just keep them in the product development team. Share them with everybody. Share the wins, share the stories, share the customer stories most importantly, because that will ultimately help get traction and help get more visibility around the business as you start to, to share those resources with the rest of the team. These are just some of the tools and templates that we actually do have on this particular um, new sort of intranet site, this new D4D site that we've just created. The customer problem statement is critical. It is like my non-negotiable element whenever I'm taking, I'm starting a piece of work with a team. It helps us ground us in what is the customer problem that we're trying to solve. So much so now that whenever my team embark on any kind of innovation project or program of work, the first thing I'll say to them is say, where's your customer problem statement? Because what it helps us do is, is basically help us define I am, as in I'm a customer who might be running a hairdressing business or whatever it might be. So it's really a narrow description of the customer that highlights their motivations, attributes and or their characteristics. What are they trying to do? So I'm trying to, what's their desired outcome? But there's a problem or barrier getting in my way. Because, trying to identify what that root cause is, and then which makes me feel. And really tapping into that emotion, whether it's frustrated, disappointed, um, you know, confused. You know, there's a lot of emotions in there that can really affect your customers and the solution that you're working through. So having your teams define that customer problem statement up front really helps to ensure that you're focusing on the right things before you embark on any project. Because you can't complete that unless you've spoken to your customer. And again, a great business analyst, a great product owner, they may know that because they've already heard that story many, many times in, in terms of preparing backlogs, working with voice of customer feedback, but by validating that customer problem statement with the customer, it's really key to ensure that you're on the right track. We would then, um, I would then encourage you to think about your hypothesis statement. So if you think about the approach to innovation and particularly experimentation, what's your hypothesis? Because it's really easy to declare something after the fact, but it's really difficult to be bold enough to declare something before you start to experiment with something. Again, a critical step that I see so many teams um, fail to adopt where if you think about, you define your hypothesis. So it could be, um, if we, uh, let's think of something. If we create um, a two minute video, a two minute how-to video content, um, we would expect to, then what we, the outcome that we'd be looking for is that we would then expect to see 
um, you know, views increase by 10%, as an example. And this is some, these are different, these are legitimate business examples that I've used in my team. And if you think in a customer success um, type environment where we get a lot of how-to questions from our customers, we're continuing to try to find ways to add value and add customer benefit to our customers to help them use the product, particularly when they may not want to call, they may not want to chat with us, they may want to self-serve. So for us, one of the experiments that we ran a, a number of years ago now was myself and one of my team members, we went out and visited customers to say, well, if you need to learn to, learn to know how to use QuickBooks, where do you go for this information? And what they did, they said one person was like, I'm just going to pick up the phone and ring my account manager. We like, well, that's not always practical. The other team member said, I just want videos. And the more customers we spoke to, they said, I just want a quick video, two minutes, so I can watch it, hit pause, work it out what I need to do in the software and then come back to it. And that completely influenced our, our digital strategy for customer success, so much so that we now have the US teams adopting our practices in Australia because we were small and nimble enough to be able to take this approach to run a really lightweight experiment. The experiment cost us nothing to run, zero dollars. And what it identified, what the experiment helped us to achieve was through the customer feedback, was that it helped us identify that the microphone set up through the laptop that my, my colleague had, did the audio, the audio wasn't strong enough. So we then went out and spent $165 on a, on a much better quality microphone. You know, over the, over the sort of the six months that, endured, that followed, we then said, well, you know what, let's keep testing this. Let's keep seeing what customer feedback there were. And now we do what we call a quick cuppa. So we call it cup of tea in Australia. So we have now this new quick cuppa series, which is like an FAQ series where it's like a, an interview style format with our team for our customers. And again, we do all that in-house. We don't use marketing agencies. We've actually now invested in a, I think the camera and the, and the microphone setup might have cost us $500 now. So we've got like a lighting, like a portable lighting, um, a different sort of video set up now. But again, the total investment is probably cost us about six, seven hundred Australian dollars and we do it all in-house. Now we've tested it with a marketing agency and it cost us $1,000 per video. And that video went for about a minute and took us, I think, 10, day, 10 to 14 days to turn around. We can now do this on site within hours and the only investment is our team's time, which to me is really powerful because they're the experts and I want to put them front and centre with our customers. But it just shows you that when you're bold enough to go, there's a customer problem that we need to solve, I want to be clear on what the hypothesis is that I'm trying to solve for, and then you get out there and test it, the insights and the surprises can be really, really surprising. It's one of the key things that we talk about in Design for Delight is to savour the surprises. Because I could never have predicted any of those insights would have come along had I gone to an agency, had I done other things. But my team now feel empowered to create video content whenever they need to. So really powerful to use and declare your hypothesis statement before you embark on your project. And then finally, bring it all together. So the next loop template is, again, something that we use and something that we teach, um, teach at Intuit. Because what it does is it helps you bring and declare all of those key elements together. So we talk about the customer problem, which you've spoken about already. Declaring our ideal state. So what is your ideal state for the future for your customer? Once you've identified the problem and you've built the solution, what is that ideal state? And then your idea. What's the idea that ultimately you're going to focus on trying to build for your customers? We then can then document our leap of faith assumptions, declare our experiments, um, capture the learnings and what it is that we learn, and then ultimately a decision. And again, in the, in the concepts of lean, are you going to pivot? Are you going to perish? Or are you going to persevere? So what are you going to do with that idea? Again, that whole process can take hours to run through. Not weeks, not months, not quarters, hours. And that's why I found it to be so powerful because the learnings that you get can be instant and can be really rapid to ultimately help inform the direction that you ultimately want to take. So again, looking at that next loop um, sort of template is just a way to capture all of those different ideas and how you want to approach your experimentation strategy. So a couple of other ideas um, to, that you can consider, and this is something that, these are just some new ideas that I thought I'd just pop up um, as part of our innovation approach at Intuit that we're also experimenting with. Now these may, may or may not work for some organisations, but it's something that helps you to really put the customer front and centre of what you do. So we've actually, um, and this is actually a photo from our Brazil, um, from our Brazilian office, we've actually created a delight studio. 
So what a Delight Studio is, is it's actually really helping to capture all of your customer personas, all of the, um, the insights, um, you know, so that you can visually see what it is that you're working on. Now, this is very different to our Kanban walls where we're thinking about our, you know, tracking our, our scrum in our daily stand-ups, um, tracking the work, that, you know, the, the different completion of the different stories, very different. Similar in, in concept in some ways because it's visual and I think that's what I've found is that over the years it's really interesting where we all want to go digital and it's important to be digital whether you're using... Um, whether you're using, you know, your Jira systems or whatever it is you're using for your story tracking, whatever system you are, of course, there's going to be a digital element. However, having that physical paper-based element, it creates interest. It creates constant visual reminders around the office. It's a talking point. So as people are walking through the corridor, they stop and they go, oh, what's this? Talk to me a little bit more about it. You know, I had a corridor, I had a really high traffic corridor a couple of years ago, my, my product management rolled into it, where I'd mapped out an entire new workflow for our customers. And every time we had a, a VP or we had someone visit in the office, I'd have people come and say, Bianca, talk to me about this wall. What, what's, what's, what's going on here? And I could walk them through the customer journey. I could walk them through the experiences that we were ultimately trying to design for. Because again, they could then build customer empathy because they could see it, touch it, feel it, versus just being lost in a, you know, in some sort of backlog, um, backlog sort of tool or a story creation tool. So again, just an idea. It doesn't have to be a dedicated space like this. It could be those really large pieces of cardboard that you can actually move around the office. I've seen plenty of different organisations approach that in different ways. But again, really important to create some visual space um, so to really inspire your teams and help tell the story of what it is that you and your team are working on. Some of the principles, um, as I said, is really think of them as acting as like an evolving, mos um, an evolving mosaic of document um, project exploration and knowledge creation. As I said, I was helping to use it to tell the story of others um, as they were coming to the office. And that way then they also knew what I was working on. They could see it. They knew what the most important customer problems were. And ultimately, I'm um, helped to really tell that story on my behalf. But the five core principles are really to help you to develop shared customer empathy to present, and, to present and really to make sure that you can um, help to sort of observe the future at the same time, to construct an, orienta an exploration orientated, um, an experimental orientated way of thinking. So knowing that this is gonna change because based on the different experiments that you're running, things will evolve and things will change and it's very interactive, which is part of the process. Um, it allows us to tell our customer stories and then finally it helps us to foster an intensely creative environment focused on learning fast, which as you all know, one of those core principles to lean is learning as quickly, and if you are gonna fail, fail quickly, fail often, but fail cheaply. I think that's the key part. Nobody wants to, to hang their hat to that half a million dollar, million dollar, two million dollar mistake or that project that gets canned. We've all seen it. We've all been parts of or seen or heard them in our organization. No one wants to be the leader of that project. So these are different ways that you can help to avoid those kinds of mistakes from occurring because you're testing your way in incrementally at each step of the process. At the end of the day, though, you can't do any of it without an amazing team. You know, and our team, my team, um, are our secret source. You know, when I look at um, the reason why, you know, I was invited here today is because, you know, my team have won a number of customer success um, service awards in Australia because they genuinely care about our customers. It's not just the values on the wall. It's not just about you know, picking up a phone or answering a chat session. My guys go above and beyond to deliver for our customers. And I really hope that you can connect with this sort of the story that I've shared with you today, because as leaders, we can all be amazing or consider ourselves to be amazing and inspiring leaders, but we can only do so much and we have to lead through our teams. And so really by teaching your teams and taking your teams on the innovation journey, hopefully you can help your team to also become your secret source and help you focus on delivering awesome for your customers. So with that, I will close and I will share my contact details for anybody who does want to learn more. Um, I'll also draw to your attention that link on the bottom, um, Intuit Labs. If you go to intuitlabs.com, what you'll find, it's a website, um, it's, not a, it's not a website that we use often, but there's some great tools and resources that I've showed you today that you might want to have some time to have a look at, maybe share with your teams back in the office at the end of the conference, just to sort of take some other learnings and insights away. 
But if you Google Design for Delight or Intuit D for D, you'll find plenty of content available that I've shared with you today um, that you can hopefully all, um, all apply and go from there. So with that, I'll open up for questions. We'll see.